All right, and welcome to week number five. I can't believe we've already made it five weeks into our series. Um, we're going to work on division this week. Uh, next week will be our final week together um, for, we'll look at a bunch of other different routines and ways that we can support student learning. Um, but we're going to finish up our operations today with division. Um, I'm going to start out with sharing my screen. Uh, so like always, we're going to start with um, where do we expect to see that US um, standard algorithm uh, for division. Um, we know that when we looked at addition and subtraction, um, both of those, when we're talking about the standard algorithm, um, students must be able to fluently use the standard algorithm for addition and subtraction in grade four. In multiplication, it's fluently used that standard algorithm in grade five. And so this week we're building on that for division. Um, and so fluently using the standard algorithm for division um, is grade six. That is where we expect to see that happen. Um, so we're actually going to make a lot of connections this week between some of the strategies that we used for multiplication and how once students have those for multiplication, we now use them um, kind of in reverse for division. Much like addition and subtraction, we can use those strategies kind of back and forth. With multiplication and division, we can do that similarly um, because they're connected, right? Multiplication and division are connected. Um, so let's take a look at the video. Um, I'm going to share with you um, the video from uh, Graham, Fletchy, uh, Graham Fletcher on gfletchy.com. Um, we've watched all of those. We did the Sorry, the addition and the subtraction videos. We did the multiplication video last week. We will continue with this division video, um, and that will kind of kick off our day today. Please let me know if you do not hear. Of all the things that students must learn by the time they leave elementary school, Division might be the, one of the toughest. So here we look to tackle the progression of division, and it starts in third grade. So take this for example, 12 divided by four. Let's see what happens. Well, we have two completely different models. And what this says is that the context, the story of the problem, plays a large part in developing students' conceptual understanding. In one, we have 12 bears with four in each group, which gives us three groups, and 12 bears shared with four friends, which leaves us three with each group. One model, well, that's measurement or repeated subtraction. The other is fair share, which I think we're all pretty familiar with. In one example, we have the group is unknown, and in the other, the size of the group is unknown. As students begin to develop their understanding of division, they probably begin to really rely on this fair share model. But 54, that's going to take a long time using fair share. So we need to put students in a place where they begin to become more flexible and efficient thinkers. So they might begin, instead of doing one by one, they might say, I'm going to take out five and put five in each group to start. Then with their remaining pieces, they might put two in each group and so on. So within each group of six, they've placed a group of five, a group of two, and another group of two. So when you take 54 and you divide it into six groups, you get nine in each group. Now here students are making the connection between the concrete, the representation, and the abstract. And you know what? It all makes sense because students are building these pieces conceptually. As students begin to explore again in third grade, they deal with quotients which are greater than 10. Here students might begin to explore the idea of division with base 10 blocks. So they'll start with 72, and instead of putting it into three groups, they'll put it into three rows. They'll start by placing 10 in each row, then 10 in each row, 
And then they have that 10. And in order to place it in each row, they need to decompose it, make a fair trade. So you can see that when we take 72 and we divide it into three rows, we have 24 in each row. And then we want to make that connection from the concrete with the base 10 blocks to the representation. And how do we record our representation in a written expression? And some students might begin to collectively group their tens. And that's where the 20 came from. The best part about this is that students are making a connection back to multiplication by using the distributive property. And they're seeing it visually. In fourth grade, yep, yeah, that's right. All that understanding we just saw should have been happening in third grade. But it might not be mastered. But in fourth grade, students will take four digit div dividends and one digit divisors and begin to extend their understanding of division. But one thing has to be taking place, and that's continually making the connection between models and representations and written expressions. Here we'll take 144 and divide it into nine groups, one into each group, and so on and so on and so on. Again, that fair share model. But what does that model look like as a written expression? Well, here are the students repeatedly removing groups of nine from the 144. Now, is this efficient? No, not at all. But it's really important that students work through this step and they realize what efficient and non-efficient thinking looks like. So after students do the example of 144 divided by nine, we might throw them in a place with this number, where the dividend is 3,672. Well, they start removing groups of nine. And immediately they say, oh, wow, I'm going to be here forever. This is going to take the longest time. Can, can I take out a group of 100? Sure you can. You can take out whatever groups you want. So they can take out a group of 100, a group of 200, and then another group of 100 nines, and then a group of six nines. Students have to make sense of the mathematics, and we can't tell them what to do. So here, they're removing their partial quotients. So from the expression, they go ahead and create an area model. And what's beautiful about this area model is that it connects back to multiplication, except it's the area model for partial quotients. Then, as students begin to dive into fifth grade, they extend this understanding that they've built conceptually from third and fourth grade. Only this time, they deal with four-digit dividends and two-digit divisors. The big piece here is that students deal with numbers and equations where they'll only have whole number quotients. All that means is that the decimal shouldn't be in the answer, but it can be in the dividend and we can have a decimal in the divisor. So here we make that connection again between the representation and the expression. And we write our partial quotients off to the side, just helps us keep track. So students might not know all their multiplication facts, but they do know three or four. So here's their products of 32. Every student will know these. Let them start there. Now, decimals, what about decimals? Well, this same understanding of partial quotients and area model can be applied to decimals. Here we have one in 24 hundredths, and we're continually removing groups of four hundredths. Connections are being made, and it's a progression, which makes it much easier for students to move between whole numbers to decimals and from decimals back to whole numbers. There's just an example. Instead of using three tens, a student might think flexibly and use 25 four hundredths. Now in sixth grade, students encounter the term standard algorithm. And all that really means is a series of repeated steps. So if students have used the same understanding of partial quotients from third grade, this is a standard algorithm. So let's see what a student might do. Well, in 8,425, I want to take out 200, remove 200 groups of 32, and then 60 groups of 32, and three groups of 32. Let's look what it looks like with the standard algorithm. Well, 32 doesn't go into eight, but 32 goes into, goes into, what does that mean? And here we have the traditional algorithm, which many of us are familiar with. 
But you see how there is a connection between the two. Which one has understanding? So there's lots of things taking place all the way up from third grade to sixth grade. Let's not rush it. Remember that the turtle won the race. Let's look to continue the conversation on Twitter or hit me up on my blog. Thanks for stopping in. Great, so I am going to come back to you guys. Um, so thinking about that um, really makes us change maybe the way we thought about um, division. So often we jump into that standard algorithm and we don't take the time to build out or maybe use those manipulatives um, to help students build out um, their understanding. And we typically get into like a mnemonic device and we think about um, you know, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, repeat, and we kind of get students into that um, following of steps, but we don't think about what does that actually mean. So let's take a look at some of those strategies. We'll walk through um, some of those strategies and make connections to the multiplication strategies that we used. Um, I'm seeing, so like what if a program introduces the standard algorithm? It may. Programs, um, depending on when they were written and, and whether or not they're following um, what standards they're following, they may, students may see um, the standard algorithm ahead of time, but the standard isn't for them to know it fluently until the grade six. So they might be introduced to it earlier, um, but they're not expected to have that down fluently until grade six according to our state standards. All right, Let's see if I can get us going. We'll start with um, our equal groups. So often... Jen, before yes. you start, yep. I just want to remind everybody, if you click on the speaker view in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll be able to see Jen more clearly. Thank you for helping me remember that I needed to change over my recording as well. <laughs> Um, so when we start to think about equal groups, this really comes in when we're starting with multiplication. Um, if we're looking at 18 divided by 3, so if I have 18 of something and I'm, I'm going to set it up with a context, students will first start with this whole idea of three equal groups. Right, so I've got my equal groups and now they're going to share them out. It's like they're playing cards or they're sharing a snack. I could say I have 18 cards in the deck. I have three people playing. How many are each of them going to get? So we share them out one at a time. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18. So I can see that 18 divided by three leaves me with six in each group. So this really is where students start to talk about um, fair shares and equal distribution. Um, you also will start to see problems where students have, um, like if I had 19 divided by three, we start to have that conversation about, well, what what does that extra one do? We can't give it to just one, so what do we do with that? It starts our conversation around fractions when we get there. Um, so if you think about the division sign, we're thinking about maybe a fraction, a number over a number, right? Division, that's what fractions really, lead, this leads to fractions. Um, so when we divide this out, here's our visual model we might also see that repeated addition. So 18, take away three, take away three, take away three. I'm gonna kind of come up here. And so 12, take away three is nine. Take away three, take away three, take away three. And now I need to figure out how many times did I take away three? I took it away one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so we can see that it's just like our problem here where we may have started with actual physical blocks and distributed them into equal groups. I've got my tallies here that I'm now distributed into equal groups. 
each time I distributed one, 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 I took away three from the amount that we had to distribute. So the first time I dealt out one, 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 I still had 15 more I needed to distribute out. So that's exactly what this first part here looks like. 18 take away three is 15. I gave away one more to each group. I had 12 more to still distribute. I gave another three away and, and so on until we have distributed all of them. And then we have to go back and see how many times did we give that away? And we gave it away six times or six to each person. So we also start to use arrays in third grade, or we use arrays a lot with multiplication in third grade. So eventually we move beyond this equal distribution here and we create an array. So when we look at this problem, I'm now going to think about the array. So this is where I would give students maybe um, the inch square tiles. They often come in like red, yellow, green, and blue. And we would say, okay, I want to model this problem, 27 divided by 9. I would have them use those blocks. And when we start to think about it, we're thinking about how many groups of 9 can we do? So students would start you know, by laying out, and we eventually would get nine. So there's my nine, and I would continue to fill in this array. So what that eventually would look like No, my picture's not exactly to scale, but I would end up with this. There are 27 blocks here. I broke them into rows of nine. And so then I'm looking at, well, how many rows of nine did I have? I had three. So I know that 27 divided by nine is three. This is also kind of like that reverse of three times nine is 27, the array that we made when we were doing multiplication. And so we have students play around with these. We can also talk about um, if I didn't get a whole number here, I had leftovers, what does that mean, right? We get into that remainder. Um, and we're still not talking about changing those remainders into um, decimals or fractions. At this point, they're just gonna be leftovers. They're going to be remainders. Um, we might have a conversation around, depending on the context of the problem, what does that remainder mean? In a problem where, um, so 27 divided by nine, I have, um, 27 cookies, I divide them amongst nine students. Each student is going to get three. 28 cookies divided by nine. I'm gonna end up with one left over. Well, what does that one left over mean? What can I do with that one left over? You can start those conversations. If it's a cookie, essentially I could break it up and give each person part of a cookie. Um, kids will be really creative. They'll think about, well, the teacher could get one, um, but they'll start to come up with a, a solution of what to do with this remainder. Now, if we're talking about pencils and I have a leftover pencil, does it make sense to break the pencil into nine more pieces and equally distribute that? It does not. So we think about they're each going to get three and there's going to be this one left over. So how many would each student get? They would get three. And we're not going to worry about that leftover. Whereas if we're doing a problem where um, there's 27 students and we're going on a field trip, we're going to take not, uh, nine cars. Three people fit in each car. Three students fit in each car. Um, let me back up, 27 students, we're gonna take vehicles, vans, there we go, vans that fit nine people each. How many vans are we going to need? We would need three. But if I had 28 students, nine students fit in each van. This time I divide, I get three, but I have that remainder, I have one left over. Well, what are we going to do with that student? I can't just stick them in the van. They don't fit. This is a case where we now need an additional 
van, so we would need four. So we start to make sense of the problems, and we're starting to talk about those contexts and what leftovers um, would mean, what we would have to do with those. Okay, so back to actually the, uh, the getting to the standard algorithm of division. So we start with these arrays. We would use base 10 blocks to start to model um, larger numbers. So if I had um, 108 divided by um, 12, I have 108 blocks. I'm wanting to divide them into groups of 12. So here's my long and my new one. So this is my 12 here. One long is 10, my one and my one. I have 108. If I'm doing that, I can say, well, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Jeez, I'm not sure. I still have um, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. I'm up to 60 now. So I'm going to do 70, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84. I'm up to 94, 95, 96. So I'm still, I'm still trying to get to that 108. So 96, there's 106, 107, 108. So again, these are my base 10 blocks. I would model this with the actual blocks. Once we can do that, they may not need to move to this pictorial version of this because it becomes quite extensive to write out, um, but they certainly could model it with the blocks. And so now I have all these groups of 12. How many 12s made 108? So I can count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Made up my, I could put them up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if we kind of flip this back around, 12 times 9 equals 108. So there's a lot of parts to keep together here, uh, especially when you're using those base 10 blocks. Um, and that's where to model it out, you need space. You might actually take a piece of chart paper like this and draw out your division kind of signs. Um, and be able to have students work in that. So they have a large space to work out those base 10 blocks. And We're going to move. You move before yep. you move on, there is a question. It says, I lost you on the counting. How do you know how many tens in one? Okay, so here's my 12. I'm breaking them into groups of 12. And so because I knew that I needed to get to 108 and I had um, kind of a long ways to go, I did several at a time, and, and really I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have said, here's 10, and once that's 12, here's another 12, so I have 24. I now have 36, okay, so I have a 10 and more. So I'm at 36, another 12, so a 10 and two more ones is 48. Another 10 and two ones is 60. Another 10 and two ones is 72. Another 10 and two ones is 84. Another 10 and two ones is 96. And another 10 and two ones gets me to the 108. So students are literally breaking out, in this case, those groups of 12. Just like we did when we showed the subtraction um, or the, the circles where we were breaking out um, into smaller chunks, this is just a way to model it with the base 10 blocks, and you would go 12 at a time, and essentially you're taking away that 12 from 108 each time until you get to 108. So yes, it's like skip counting by 12s. Yep. So then we get into the area model, and before I model that with uh, division, I just want to remind you about uh, multiplication. So 18 times 4 
if I was going to do the area model for 18 times 4, I have my 4, 18, I'm going to break that into 10 and 8. So 10 and 8 is the 18 times 4. 4 times 10, so I'm finding the area. In this case, um, if I can give you the analogy of, I know the dimensions of the room, and I want to know the area of the rug that I need to cover the room. So in this case, the room is a, an 18 by 4 or 4 by 18 room, and I'm finding the total, because this is multiplication, 4 times 10 is 40. 4 times 8 is 32. 40 and 32 together is 72. And if I'm thinking about the rug, I would need 72 square feet of rug. To now, we're going to move that area model into division. And to do that, we now know the size of the rug. And I know the dimensions of one side. And I want to know how big of a room, what's the other dimension of that room, if I know the area of the rug, of the, of the rug that I already have. So if I have a rug that's 384 square feet, and I'm dividing it by six, so... If I'm thinking about the rug analogy, the rug is 384 square feet, but it's only six feet wide. I want to know how long that rug would be. I can, again, make my area. It's six wide. Well, I don't know how many times six goes into 384, but I know that six tens is 60. So I can think about, I'm already 60 and I need to get to 384. So I could do another 60. So the area that I want this to make is 384, 60 and 60, I'm at 180. Geez, I still have a ways to go. I'm going to say 20 this time. 20 times 6, or two of these, right, is 120. So now I'm at 240. If I need to, I can keep track over here. 384, I have subtracted 240 so far. I have 144 more to go. I can take another 120 out of that. So I could take another 20. And now I have 24 more left to go. Six goes into 24 four times. So when I look at this area, 60 plus 60 plus 120 plus 120 plus 24 is equal to 384. And so now I want to know, I divided by 6. How many times did I get groups of 6 out of this 384? I have 10 plus 10 plus 20. I'm up to 40 plus 20 is 60, plus four more is 64. Now, if I knew right away that 40 times six, is that right? I'm questioning myself now. I think I'm right. Yes, I'm right. If I was um, not sure about this 20, I could have taken away 60s six times to get there. But if I knew that 60 
times six was 360, I could have started there. So let me show you, this is one way to solve this problem here, but you can actually use whatever numbers a student understands. So I'm gonna, I know you can't see it, I'm just gonna tape it, tape it there. Um, again, we have 384 divided by six. I'm gonna make this same area model if I know some facts about six, once students start to look at these facts, I know that six times six is 36. So six times 60 is 360. I can use that 60 there. I know that I'm wanting to get to 384. I am, twenty four still away from three hundred eighty four I could do it by six I'm going to take away six so that's um six so that's a one right one group of six is six. Oh, I know that six times three is eighteen so I'm going to take away a group of three for eighteen so when I add these individual areas up I get three hundred eighty four so when I look at how many times did six go into 384, 60 plus one plus three is 64. So I can, this problem can look different for different students based on the facts that they know. So maybe I didn't know this piece of information And I only knew tens. So I could do 10 and I would keep track. Another 10, I'm at 120. I'm at 180. 240. Three hundred, three hundred sixty. I'm getting there. There's not sixty more to go. So three hundred sixty. Well, I'm going to take it away six at a time. So I'm down to three hundred sixty. So three hundred sixty-six, three hundred seventy-two, three hundred seventy-eight. 384, so I've got my area, it's broken out into smaller chunks, and I can just add up how many times I broke six out. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. Okay, so that's where students need to have a strong understanding of the area model with multiplication to be able to work that backwards. And then when we're ready to move on from the model. Jen, before yes. you move on from the model, yep. orientation of the model, is it okay if we tip it the other way? Yep, same thing. You're just chunking out areas and taking away those, um, essentially those multiplication problems, right? Yeah, we're turning it kind of into a multiplication problem. We're chunking that out. And we're taking out those parts until we get the full area that we're looking for. So then, once we're ready to move on from the area model, we get to partial quotient. So we're still gonna work on the problem, 384 divided by six, just so we can see how that problem moves um, across. And this time it starts out looking like a standard algorithm problem, 384, I'm gonna use a different color. And I like to put this line down, it helps me kind of delineate between my numbers. 384 divided by six. So now I'm thinking about, geez, 384, how many times does six go into 384? I'm not breaking it down into a three or 38 
I'm looking at the whole number. This is that number sense piece. We've built on number sense and we're not getting into this list of steps. So I'm thinking about, well, three can go into 384. I don't know, I'm gonna pick 10. Let's see what that does. So if it goes in 10 times, that's 60. Now I'm keeping my running tally of how many more I have to go. Well, geez, I can take another 60. Actually, I could do that. I could take 120 because that's 20 times six. Oops, sorry. I wrote those in the wrong place. 20 times six. I still have 204 more to go. I can do another 120. Sixty could come out of that, so six times ten. And six times four is twenty-four. And now I'm gonna add up how I chunk this out. Ten and twenty is thirty, and twenty is fifty, and ten more is sixty, and four is sixty-four. So you can see where this is now more of the abstract model to that area model that we used and we chunked out and drew the visual for these pieces. Now, if I didn't know six times 10 was 60, I should, by the time I'm doing this division, I should probably know that. Um, I can use different numbers. If I knew right away six times 60, was 360, I could start there. If I didn't, I could start by taking away six and taking away six and taking away six and slowly students will start to see um, what becomes more efficient. You could always have students write out some facts over here to the side. You could have them write, uh, you know, six times two so that they have these. Um, you could say six times five, Six times 10, six times 20. They might do six times 100, depending on how big the number is. And then these are some of those base facts that they can use to help them chunk out parts. So if they can't do this, Without having something like this, you could start here and having them write the facts that they know um, that could help them chunk out bigger pieces. Because we don't want a kid doing repetitive subtraction to figure out this type of problem. This type of um, partial quotient work works with two-digit numbers too when, I'm, when my divisor is a two-digit number. So we think about it in the same way. We can think about 15 times 10 is 150, 150. 15 times 100 is 1,500. I could take 1,500 away from here. So I'm gonna think about that. 15 times 100, is 1,500, I'm gonna subtract that. I can do that again. I can see that 1,500 will come out again. So 15 times 100, again. I have 1,680, I can take out another 1,500. I'm left with 180. Well, I know that 15 times 10 is 150. And 
and I know that 15 times 2 is 30. And now I can add up the parts that I've chunked out. I took 100, 200, 300, 310, 312. So it's not always so um, neat and organized. When students start this work, you want to start it with smaller numbers because they are going to subtract 15, take away 15, take away 15. They're going to start that way until they start to understand that I can say, well, two 15s is 30. I could, I could take away 30 each time. Or 10 15s is 150, and I can take that away. So you want to start with smaller numbers so that students can build up this idea of taking out smaller chunks. And eventually, we can move into that short, shorter process of long division um, because this can get cumbersome, but if students understand the number sense behind it, they're understanding how to chunk out numbers. If we then move into the standard algorithm, I'm going to go back to that 384. divided by 6 and when we start this process we're thinking about we have to divide we then multiply we subtract and bring down kids get stuck in those steps all the time but once they've built on this process of partial quotient they kind of have down that they're chunking numbers out so when we start to move into standard algorithm we're saying six goes into 384 six goes into Three, well, three, it's not really a three, it's 300. But in our process, it doesn't go in 100 numbers of, of times. So there's not going to be a digit here in our hundreds place. It's going to be less than 100 times because six times 100 is 600. So I know that my, my quotient is going to be less than 100. So I'm not going to have anything in my hundreds place. I'm now thinking about 380. So six goes into 38, but it's 380. It's going to go in to 38 six times, but really that six is in the tens place. So it really means 60. So six goes into 380. 60 something times, so 6 or 60 times 6. If this was 60, 60 times 6 is 360. See, we're still in our hundreds and tens place. Subtract. We're now bringing down the rest of our number. We're now thinking 6 goes into 24. That does 4 times. 4 times 6. 24 and I don't have any remainders so if we're building up understanding we can eventually get to standard algorithm but students who just jump to standard algorithm and don't have an, a sense of what division means and that they're really taking away it's repetitive in subtraction they're not understanding this and they just see a list of steps and um, we see this and sometimes I see the R for like repeat, but we see this, uh, you know, dad, mom, sister, brother, you know, repeat. Um, <laughs> dead monkeys smell bad. That is one I've heard taught. Um, does mom serve burgers? You know, we get into all of those um, mnemonic devices, which really don't help students understand the work that we're doing around division. I know division is a hard concept to teach kids. Sometimes it's a hard concept for adults as well. Hopefully seeing kind of how we transition from our multiplication strategies and eventually into some of our division strategies starts to understand why we don't just stick to the standard algorithm. Jen, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when you did the six 
times six and put yes. the 36. Would it be okay to have students yes. to put a zero there? Yes. So you could have that zero right here because this six really is 60 because it's in the tens place. So 60 times six is that 360. Yes. And then when we subtract 384 minus 360 is the 24 and we're no longer having to bring it down because it's already there. Yes. Any other questions that came up while we were doing that? Are we pretty, we're good to move on. We're good to move on. I stopped you with each different type of question Thank for the strategy you were showing. All right, so I'm gonna come back to share my screen, I think. No, I want this one. All right, are you seeing US standard algorithms? Okay, we'll make sure. <clears throat> nope, we don't want that. Sorry. Oh, I must have embedded it, but we don't want that. Jen, there's a question in the chat yes. box. Do they do a strategy in place value system? Where the place value shows? Um, they could certainly, you could certainly put numbers into place value. You certainly could identify these columns. And some folks actually take like either notebook paper or grid paper um, and have students use only one um, number per box in grid paper. Or if you take um, a notepad and um, hold it up, I know it's kind of hard to see, but the lines um, in a vertical direction, um, you could actually have students use those columns as their place value columns when they're doing division, and that might help keep their work organized. Because I think that's part of the large problem students have when we get into division. There's so many steps and there's so much work that they lose track of where they are. They lose track of um, where they are in the process because um, their work isn't so organized. So we have to help kids learn how to organize their work. So our game idea for this week has to do with division and using a deck of cards. Um, so I've got my same deck of cards where I have removed the tens through kings uh, and the jokers. And I'm going to start, we start with, um, you know, starting to learn two digit division divided by a single digit. So I'm going to start with flipping three cards. Um, and the cards... I got um, was a that I got was a seven eight and a five so seven eight and five um, and in this game I'm going to make a two digit number that I am dividing by a one digit number the remainder is going to be my score so whatever I get if I made um, seventy eight and I divided seventy eight by five. 78 divided by 5 is going to leave me with a remainder of 3. So I'm going to get a whole number. Uh, let's see. I would get 15 remainder 3. 3 is going to be my score for that round. My partner selects um, a 2, a 3, and a 7. And... Ooh, I'm going to make 72 divided by 3. So there's a little bit of strategy here as well as division. When students start to learn divisibility rules, which they will in grades like 4 and 5, they learn divisibility rules. I can think about what number could I make to have either no remainder or the smallest remainder. So if I have 72 divided by 3, 24 is my answer with no remainder, I get no score. And the point of this game is to have the lowest score after five rounds. So with the cards 2, 3, and 7, if I had made the number 23 and divided by 7, 
I would have a remainder of two. So my score would be two. If I had made 27 and divided by three, I would get nine, no remainder. I get zero as my score for that round. And the idea again would be to have the lowest score after five rounds. So students start to think about what the remainder is what the divisibility rules are and how can I get numbers to work together that have the smallest remainder. So when you think about that, students are doing much more than the one division problem. They're actually doing a lot of computation in their head. They're trying out different numbers. They're trying out different division problems to see what the remainder would be. So you're not only just having them practice one fact, you're really having them practice this multiple times but turning it into a game. You might also flip four cards and make a three-digit number and a one-digit number um, and do the division that way. You could even try a three-digit number divided by a two-digit number, but you probably would want students to have some paper where they could work out that problem. The routine that I want to share with you for today is called Same But Different. And so in Same But Different, you are given two pictures that have something that's the same, but also something that is different about them. And so it's really having students look at and compare and contrast the two images. So if I look at this same but different, and I'll share the website in just a moment, if I look at this one, I can see that there's a total of 12 dots on this domino. And over here, I can see that there's also a total of 12. Um, they're different because this is all one image. It's a group of six and six, whereas this is four groups of three. But it also can be the same as four groups of three because I could see this is a group of three, this is a group of three, a group of three, a group, oops, sorry, a group of three. And so they're you're talking about what do we see that's the same and what do we see that's different? And you might pull out misconceptions out of students. If I look at this one down here, 23 and two thirds, well, the digits are the same, but they're represented in different ways. In this part here, this is a two digit number. It's more than a whole, two thirds is less than a whole. So that's something that's different. So let me share that website with you. There's lots of images, and I will, same but different. Let me add that to the chat box. Oh, looks like Michelle already did, thank you. So same but different. If I click on addition and subtraction, these are gonna be images that might have to do with um, addition or subtraction. So addition problems, we can see that some of them are um, turnaround facts. Some of them might have the same sums, but they represent different numbers. If you click on them, they bring out um, the different pictures because sometimes you can't see them. Oh, yeah, and is oh. this free? It is a free website, yep. Um, all of these are um, different representations. You might find different pictures that um, you might like to use. I like, so something like this one, right? Great one for multiplication and division. If I think about this, this is three rows of six or three groups of six. This one is six groups of three, right? There's, they're arranged differently. They're in, it's kind of grouped out differently, but there's still six on this row, six and six, where there's still six, still six, and still six. Um, so there's lots of these images. You could put, the, put these up in an asynchronous setting um, and could be posted for kids to come and look at at some point, and they could then respond to you in some way, um, either email you or kind of make a comment to it, or within a class or even a very small group. If you were working with a small group of students, um, you might just ask them, what's the same and what's the difference? And it really gets them it's a compare and contrast piece, really looking at the details. And that helps students, um, see if I can find some here. It helps students look at, they're the same, in this case, value, even though they look different. 
And so we might work on subitizing. And subitizing is seeing a group of objects without having to count them. So I know that this is four without having to say one, two, three, four. Um, we do a lot of that work with dice. Um, so same but different. This looks like it's one column from here, but this one has other columns. It almost looks like a graph. So this would be our young learners who are working on um, early number, early numeracy. So there's still four bears, but two blue and two red is the same number of bears as three blue and one red. So um, there's all kinds of different um, pictures um, all the way up through geometry and algebra, place value, fractions and ratios that could be um, used for same but different. I'm going to head back to our PowerPoint. Are there um, any other questions about our work today? If not, I will share with you um, the links and I will grab that link for you and put it in the chat box. As always, please make sure um, that you um, get the link. Let's see there, it should be hyperlinked in the chat box. Um, so make sure that you grab that link. If you have trouble, um, you might be able to scan it if you have a phone that does that. And as always, if you need to um, email me to get that link, please do so. I do not mind at all if you're emailing me, I'll send you out the link. Um, I have caught up. If you have done sessions one, two, three, and four, you should have gotten your uh, math certificates for those contact hours. If you have not, feel free to email me about them. You should have gotten them. Um, I'm all caught up to date. And so I will begin sending these out tonight and I will hopefully get them out um, through the rest of the week. Um, and you should have them by the end of the week. Thank you all so much for joining today. Um, share.